Right. For philosophy, for many years, there has been one central baffling problem, which is the problem of the relationship between the mind and the brain. The problem is, how can a material brain, a physical, biological piece of hardware in your head, create uh, the world of subjective experience? We're surrounded by colour and light and sounds and scents and feelings and it's all happening. How could all that be generated, caused, by just a kind of grey lump of pudding in the head. However well and beautifully made this piece of equipment is, how could it ever create something so utterly different as subjective experience? What is the relationship between the mind and the brain? Uh, for Descartes and for the traditional philosophers, they regard it as two completely different kinds of thing. Uh, for science, that's got, got not good enough. They want to explain how one causes the other. And they've, they're completely baffled by this, uh, to the extent that they say either we need a complete breakthrough in science, or we need a whole new way of thinking. Well, the answer is, to my mind, obviously, we need a new way of thinking and talking about these things. You see, if the mind is a representation of the world, uh, if sapient reflection represents, then you would naturally expect it to be quite distinct from the brain, because the brain is the material medium. Now think about it. Uh, a poem, you don't expect a po the meaning of a poem to be caused in any way by the paper and ink that it's written on. The material medium is distinct from a representation. You don't expect the TV set to contribute anything to the content of the TV programme. You know, they're just different, they're different levels altogether. Uh, the, so this mind-brain business is exactly what you would expect if mind was a representation of the world. Well, but they will still ask, but the quality of experience, the redness of the colour red, uh, the particular feelings that we have, where do these come from? There's, there's nothing in the brain, there are no pictures in the brain. How is it that a particular wavelength strikes the eye and suddenly we experience bright blue? What possible connection could there be between the physical wavelength and the colour blue? Uh, and again, a very similar problem. How do I know that the red I experience is the same as the red you experience? These seem to be unanswerable questions. That is, again, what you would expect if perception was conceived as, uh, as representation. In any representational system, uh, writing, DNA, there are certain basic elements which are arbitrary, like in DNA, uh, the codon CAT stands for the, the amino acid histidine. Why? No particular reason. Uh, any, it's just a, it's an arbitrary code. Uh, you have, on one hand, the names of things. And on the other hand, says, why are pigs called pigs? No reason. You could call them anything. Why does red look red? Well, it has to look like something. You know, it, it, it's there is no there is no causal connection. You know, whatever reason there is that red looks red, it isn't a causal connection. It's nothing that science can get its roots on because it's arbitrary. It, that's the na that is the nature of representation. So, so what is this new way of talking and thinking that, uh, that makes better sense of, the, of consciousness and the mind? Well, it's simple enough. I've, I've actually already been using it. But what it comes down to is that mind and consciousness are activities. 
they're not things, they're not, uh, it's not a place, it's not a substance, no kind of a stuff, consciousness is not the property of the mind, all these things are things that we do, basically social activities, ways of life that involve self-reflection and self-awareness. Thought, like I said before, like Plato said, is the dialogue of the soul with itself. And I, as I explained, it's the dialogue between uh, the bodily imagination and language, talking to one another. Initially it was a social thing, initially it was talking to other people, then it becomes talking to oneself and using that language to control attention, like uh, perception is no longer direct contact with the world, we are now, we reflect on perception and see it as, a, as in sort of more pictorial terms. Uh, sensations aren't just clues to, what's, to action, uh, they are things that you can focus on. You know, when you've got the word red, you can actually look at red and think, my goodness, how red it is. And you can have, uh, you can experience the sensation of red for its own sake. And, you know, it's aesthetics. You can, with language, you can aestheticize what was in previously an entirely practical relationship to the world. And we become... You know, it's part of being a sapient, self-conscious, reflective being. So what is the relationship between mind and matter, really? I mean, the, there is a material brain, and there is thought and experience, and the, social, well, the world of social activity. Uh, what is the relationship? Well, one is the medium for the other. But they are really different kinds of things. Um, in terms of systems, you have to realise that there are material things that are defined only in terms of their physical structure, like furniture and so on, and there are biological things which are self-organising, self-reproducing, self-replicating processes in which the matter is continually changing. They're really just a pattern of relationships. Uh, they are things in a completely different sense to the way material objects are things. Uh, they're really, they're closed processes, like, like a whirlwind or an eddy. And then on the third level, there are social things, cognitive things. Also, self-organizing processes, self-representing, as I explained, self-replicating. And as biological things exist in a physical medium, so uh, cognitive, sapient things exist in a biological medium. So what is sapient consciousness? The sapient consciousness that we're all familiar with. Well, it's a personal, biosocial activity. It's, uh, it's personal because each of us thinks for ourselves and can, if we want, uh, think privately and involve nobody else in it, though in fact the kind of experiences, the kind of actions uh, that we are thinking about are always ones that we could share if we wanted. Uh, that is the nature of, of, of our of intentionality. It's biological because we do it using our bodies. We use our brains. Our brains, we are embodied creatures, you know. This is that all this thinking that we do and all this being aware and paying attention is is a physical activity. There's no dis, there's no magic in that. We are physical organisms, but we are also social creatures, and we have all these skills, all this language, all this reflective knowledge of different kinds of intentional action uh, that we have learnt from our our. Uh, sapient society that brought us up and trained us to think and be aware in the way that we are.